It's my pleasure to be here and to uh, do this uh, talk on flexible sovereignty. It's a basic introduction to open, what's called open theism. Uh, it'll be reviewed for a lot of you. For others, there might be some things new, but uh, hopefully it will generate some good discussion afterwards. Uh, this is a perspective which I first began to come to. Uh, it seems like a lot of people kind of came to this independently. There wasn't a lot of internal dialogue going on until the mid-90s, really. Uh, but around the early 80s is when I first began to open my eyes to this. Um, didn't know anyone else who believed this, uh, at least no, no Bible-believing Christians. Uh, <laughs> but I, I had gone through a, a couple years stint as a Calvinist. I, I just came to that conclusion uh, uh, just exegetically and maybe reading a little bit too much Karl Barth. Uh, but uh, for about two, three years, I, I just for ex exegetical reasons, was a Calvinist. And I've always said I, I can fully appreciate and understand how someone, for exegetical reasons, comes to the conclusion that Calvinism is true. I, can, I don't agree with that, but I really understand how you can get to that position uh, exegetically. I was there. What I could never understand, and to this day still don't understand, is how anyone can like it. Because uh, uh, honestly, when, when, I, when I came to the conclusion that everything was preordained, uh, I, I thought I have to believe this, but I never, the, the glory of God thing, and it, it, the coin never dropped. Maybe it wasn't when I left. But I, I, I didn't like it. And maybe that's why I eventually found a way of reading scripture and looking at things that was very different from that. I remember, it was around 83, I think it was, where I was just doing a kind of a devotion with my wife, and it was 2 Kings chapter 20. And uh, I was reading a story about Hezekiah. And now Hezekiah, the Lord sent Isaiah to say to him, Thus saith the Lord, uh, get your house in order because you're going to die. I'm taking you home. And Hezekiah pleaded with the Lord. And so the Lord says, Okay, I uh, changed my mind. In the light of this, I, I will extend your life 15 years. And I remember thinking to myself, When God said, I'm going to take you home, was that, was that expressing a, a genuine intention? And then when God sent this second message, thus saith the Lord, was that expressing a real change of mind? And that got my thought process going in a new direction. And it took three or four years before I really uh, landed with both feet on the ground on what I, where I stood on stuff. In fact, there was a period of time uh, between 86 and 87 where I was an openness Calvinist, strangest <laughs> animal in the world. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I'm just kind of morphing on this thing. And, and I've actually met two other people, professors actually, who are closet openness Calvinists. Uh, where they, they, for exegetical reasons, still hold that God elects people, uh, but thinks that everything else is open. So you have, a, you have a Calvinist soteriology, but an openness providence. It's a very strange thing. I don't think it's a permanent stopping point, but it's a nice place to pass through. Okay, so we're, we're here uh, talking about a flexible sovereignty, a defense of the open view of, of uh, the future. And so let's get started. The classical view of God... Can, there's a lot of different ways of, of slicing this thing and articulating it, but, but one of its, its, its core convictions is that God is pure actuality. Uh, this really comes out of, I would argue, I'm in the process of doing a book project that's already nine years overdue, uh, but I'm arguing that this basic conviction comes out of Hellenistic philosophy. Uh, you find uh, Plato in the Timaeus, uh, chapter 29, saying that that which is perfect can neither be improved nor diminished, uh, and therefore, the forms must be perfect. And later on, he argues that the, the gods must be perfect. And you find in the early church fathers, and even before him, and among Philo and some Jewish philosophers, that saying being repeated ad infinitum. I mean, it's, just, it's, 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 a, it's a truism that whatever's perfect can't be improved or diminished. And therefore, it can never change. Whatever is perfect must be utterly, utterly changeless. Because all change is either for the better or for the worse. And whatever is perfect can't be improved or diminished. Uh, and the church inherited that theology gradually over time. And with St. Augustine, it becomes sort of canonized as a central point. And that forms what is usually called classical theology. And I'm painting with very broad strokes here, I know. But this is an intro lecture, so I can get away with it. So God has acted as purist. Uh, he therefore, uh, he's exhaustively immutable. Not just in his character, but in his experience. He is uh, immutable. He's non-temporal, at least in among most uh, classical theologians, because time involves change, the measurement of change, and if God doesn't change, even in his experience, then his experience must be timeless. And God is impassable, which means he's beyond emotions, or at least passions. He can't be impacted by things, because that would uh, uh, denote change. 
And so God is completely unchanging in every possible way. Therefore, all of reality in this view is eternally settled. Because God experiences it as eternally settled. Maybe from our perspective it's not eternally settled, but from God's it is. Because God's experience, is like everything else about God, doesn't change. And so it's eternally settled either in God's will, which came to be really identified with Calvinism. It's settled because God decrees it to be that way. Or at least it's settled in God's mind. And that's what usually goes by the name of Arminianism. Uh, all the facts of what shall be uh, are settled in God's mind. So in this view, God is sovereign precisely because he's inflexible. Flexibility, contingency, change, we're all seen as being derogatory things. Thank you, Plato. Uh, it, it's, uh, perfection means you aren't uh, de dependent, contingent in any respect. Uh, everything is eternally settled and eternally fixed. And so the question we've got to ask is this. Two basic questions. Is this view biblical? And I'll here in a moment argue that uh, I don't think it is. Uh, the idea of, of a God who is above all change, all mutability, all passion, emotions, uh, contingent experiences, that's not a biblical view. I'll get to that later on. <clears throat> a second thing to ask is what is praiseworthy about that view of sovereignty? What is admirable about that view of sovereignty? Uh, we admire some things for being inflexible. For example, if a person's character is... Uh, is inflexibly perfect, a perfect human being, never, never wavers from that, that'd be admirable. But there's other things that we wouldn't consider to be admirable if you're inflexible on. In fact, I would argue that if, you're, if your character is, is perfect and solid and, and settled, for just that reason, you would be flexible in other respects. For example, suppose that Clark here is a perfect human being. It's not too hard to imagine. And he's got a perfect character, and therefore he's perfect loving. He's perfectly loving. And he walks into this uh, auditorium uh, 45 minutes ago, and he's in a happy mood, just had a great dinner, called his wife, and, and, and so he's, he's, he's whistling zippity doo da, zippity day. Very happy. He comes in, and there's a person sitting in the front row here bawling, crying, just weeping. Uh, Clark notices this woman, but he just continues to go on whistling zippity doo da, zippity day, because he is invariant and inflexible in his demeanor. Every, in every respect, he's inflexible. Would you admire that? See, it seems to me that if, in fact, if, if, if Clark didn't, wasn't impacted, wasn't altered, wasn't fundamentally changed by this woman's distraught condition, then we wouldn't regard him as being a perfect character because a perfect character is one that responds to people, is willing to adjust and change, to be impacted, to be empathized, to empathize with, with another. Uh, Clark wouldn't be wholly defined by this woman's distraughtness, but he would certainly be, be impacted. And so... Uh, one might think, and this is the perspective of the open view, that God is, is uh, invariant, is stable, settled, eternally fixed, if you will, in every respect in which it's virtuous to be stable, but God is flexible in every respect in which it's virtuous to be flexible. There is uh, change even within God. So here's, well, here's an alter alternative perspective. Uh, a view of God, God's sovereignty that incorporates flexibility. And this view, God is immutable uh, in his God-defining attributes, immutable in love and, uh, in, 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 uh, attributes like omnipotence and omniscience and things of that sort, uh, but flexible in, 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 in his experience and plans and interactions because he's interacting with a world that is forever changing. And precisely because God is, is invariant in his perfect character, he's perfectly variant in his experience and interactions and responses. Because that's what it is to be a perfect personal being. Plato, you can understand why he would say that perfection uh, never uh, changes, because he's talking about abstract forms. But if you're talking about a, a personal being, what it means to be perfect is something very different. And I think one of the fundamental mistakes that the early church made was they took a, a definition of perfection that applied to abstract forms and would apply to mathematical formulas and things of that sort, and they applied it to a personal being. In this alternative perspective, then, the future is not eternally subtle, but is at least partly open to possibilities. So here's the open view of the future in a nutshell. And I uh, like to call it the open view of the future as opposed to the open view of God. Because while it presupposes that God is open to creation, that's not its main distinctive. Because there's 
fact, most theologies would want to say that. I think this view does it more consistently than others, but that's not its main distinctive. Its main distinctive, I will argue, is its view of reality, and more specifically, its view of the future. In this view, God knows all things. God knows all things. I, I want to emphasize that point because you read any book that critiques this view, and they will say that the open view doesn't think that God knows all things. I, I haven't met an open theist who denies that God knows all things. God is omniscient. Reality and God's knowledge are, are coextensive. Now, there are some that would qualify that a little bit and say God knows all that can be known because there are truths out there that are, are by definition unknowable, and we could argue about that, and I think that view is wrong, but, that, that's, but they don't deny omniscience, that whatever is real, God knows if it's knowable. God knows all things. But the all things, and here's the distinctive view, the all things that God knows includes future possibilities. So the view is, some of reality, like the past, the present, and some of the future, is definite. It's definitely this way, and definitely not that way. It's definite. And therefore, it's perfectly known by God as such, because God knows all things. He knows them exactly as they are. So whatever is definite, God knows as definite. But some of reality in this view, namely some of the future, is indefinite. It's possibly this way, and possibly that way. And precisely because God is omniscient and knows all of reality exactly as it is and not otherwise, God knows it as possibly this way and possibly that way. So in the open view, what's distinctive is that we hold that possibilities are ontologically real. They're not just due to the fact that human beings have limited knowledge. Rather, they're built into reality. Possibilities are ontologically real. And God knows all of reality perfectly and therefore knows the definite as definite and the possible as possible. In this view, God settles whatever he chooses ahead of time, and he opens up possibilities ahead of time to whatever extent he chooses. I, um, it's a gross simplification, but the best analogy I have of the open view of uh, the future is, uh, and I don't know even know if they still make these, but when I was a kid they did. It's the Choose Your Own Adventure books. Are those still around? Oh, the, okay, I, I can still keep on using this uh, analogy and it'll have meaning to people who are younger than 50. Uh, <laughs> but you know, choose your own adventure book. The, the novelist writes stories. It's a story, but the reader gets to choose uh, uh, between possible storylines. If you think Sally should buy the dog, go to page number this. If you think Sally should not buy the dog, go to that page. And then, so now you, you're on the story where Sally buys the dog. Well, if you think the dog should get, you know, should go across the street and and get hit by a car, then go to this page. If you think it shouldn't go across the street, uh, then go to this page. And, and, and the, the, the book branches out into several possibilities and then ends up with several different endings. That is something like, infinitely simplified of course, but something like the open view of, of providence, the open view of reality. God sets the parameters of reality. Uh, he sets the parameters within which spontaneity and creativity and free decisions can make, human angelic and and, the, and down to quantum particles, there's a determinate structure to reality, but within the determinate structure of reality, uh, there are possibilities that can get played out. There's, there's a number of ways this thing can go. Now, there are limits to that, so it's not a wide open free-for-all, but there is genuine openness within the parameters uh, that God sets. He delimits reality to whatever extent he wants, but he leaves it open to whatever extent that he wants. This is why I really think that openness theologians make a mistake when they say that God doesn't know the future. Uh, because if you were to ask the novelist of a great Choose Your Own Adventure uh, book, do you know the future of your book? The novelist should say, well, of course I do. I wrote the thing. Now, do you know which, which future the, uh, the reader is going to choose? Well, no. But you asked me a question about the book. And, uh, and so I would want to say, yes, God knows the future perfectly. And the future partly consists of possibilities. And that's why he knows the future partly as a realm of possibilities. Some would disagree with that, but... I give them the right to be wrong if they want. Let's move on. <laughs> okay. This is a very important point. And then I'm going to get into some of the reasons why people hold to the open view. But I would argue, and I think most openness folks would argue, that God is infinitely intelligent. There's no, there's no upper limit to his intelligence. And therefore, he can anticipate each possibility as perfectly as if it was a certainty. And I think this is a very important point. The reason is that I, I used to be puzzled up until maybe five or six years ago, I, I was always puzzled how very 
smart people seemed to have trouble understanding this perspective. Um, and I, I, you know, people that I know are, are very smart and, and can figure stuff out. They would keep on uh, charging the same, uh, the openness view of, of, of making the same mistakes. Even if we answered it very coherently, they keep on repeating it over and over again. And they keep mis 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 misrepresenting that. And at first I thought, are they intentionally trying to caricature the view? And maybe there's some of that going on. But the Bible says to believe all things and hope all things. So I try to give the best interpretation to everything. So I want to believe that they're sincerely representing it as they understand it. And yet they're representing it so poorly. And yet I know they're smart. How is that possible? And a coin fell in the slot for me some time ago where I, I realized that for a lot of people, the open view, the idea that the future is not exhaustively settled, either in God's will or in God's mind, it creates fear in them. They, they, they're afraid, it feels to them like God is out of control. The world's out of control. How do you know he's going to win in the end? Uh, how do you know that he can bring good out of evil? You know, what if he gets caught off guard and, and, and this, the, the, the whole cosmos takes a left turn and Satan does something radically he didn't anticipate and, you know, the whole world literally goes to hell in a handbasket. And there's this kind of terror that descends on some people. Uh, the idea of God at least foreknowing, if not preordaining the whole of the future, is for many people a real source of security. And I also know that it's impossible to really learn something that you're terrified of. Uh, you, when, once your amygdala kicks in, your fight or flight reaction is in place, and your neocortex is doing very little activity. <laughs> and, uh, and this is why I now, whenever I go to speak to an audience that is potentially hostile, and back in those days, in the 90s, almost every audience was hostile, uh, but I, I, I first have to, put, have to put them at ease, and I do it with this uh, infinite intelligence argument. And here's, the, here's the argument in a nutshell. The reason why you and I have trouble anticipating possibilities uh, as effectively as certainties. In fact, we can't anticipate possibilities as effectively as we do certainties. The reason we ha that's the case is because we're finite in intelligence. We have a limited amount of intelligence to go around. Some of us more limited than others for sure, but all of us limited. And uh, so if I have three possibilities I have to consider, I have to, I have to fraction up my attention and intelligence in thirds to cover those three possibilities. If I have 30, I have to spread it even thinner. Whereas if I only have one thing to pay attention to, well, I can be preparing myself for, for that all day long. So we're less effective at anticipating possibilities than we are certainties. This is why if you're playing chess, it's a lot more stressful if, you, if it matters to you than if you're working on an assembly line. Because in a, in a chess game, you've got to anticipate all the possibilities. They might move there, and I then have to move here, and then I might move there. And, and there's all these possibilities you have to consider. consider Whereas if you're working on an assembly line, you know that the bolt goes in that hole all day long. And, and so you don't stress out over that. Well, God is not limited in his intelligence. Which means that God could anticipate each and every one of a trillion, trillion, trillion possibilities to the trillionth power a trillion times over. He could anticipate each and every one of those as though it was the only possibility. You don't fraction up infinity. It's as though all of God's attention is on this one possibility. And all of God's attention is on this possibility. And on this one. And so on for as many possibilities as there are. So whatever comes to pass, whatever was possible, God knows all of reality, and whatever comes to pass obviously was possible. Whatever comes to pass, God's been looking at that possibility from all eternity as though it had to happen. And so God can have a plan in place on how to respond to that possibility as though it had to happen. It's like if you're playing God in chess, you're going to lose. <laughs> they say that a novice chess player can think effectively ahead three moves. I'll do this, then he'll do this, but then I'll do this. And that's about where you wear out. Uh, a a world-class person, I'm told, can think effectively 30 moves, either 3 across 10 deep or 10 across 3 deep, which is why a world-class chess champion will always beat the novice. Well, God can think infinitely this way and infinitely, infinitely wide and infinitely deep. And so every possible scenario a chess game could ever go, he's anticipating it and preparing for it as though it had to go that way. If you're playing God in chess, four moves into it, God might say, in not more than 17 moves you're checkmated. 
And you're looking at this game and you're going, no way. I'm getting the advantage here, God. Uh, then three moves later on, God says, now and not more than six moves. Uh, and possibly in as few as two, you'll be checkmated. And you still can't see it. Because you're thinking in a very limited capacity, you can go three across, uh, one deep, or one, 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 deep, one and three deep. But God's doing the whole chessboard. Whatever move you make, God has been anticipating that very move from the beginning of the game as though you had to make it. And so when you make it, he's got a response in place. So an open theist can say that whatever comes to pass, it obviously was eternally possible that it would come to pass at just this time. And God is infinitely intelligent, so God knew that. And so whatever comes to pass, I can say God has been anticipating this from the foundation of the world as though it had to come to pass. And has, therefore, has, I can trust he's got a plan in place to bring good out of evil. It's just that. Now, God is so smart. He didn't have to know for certain it would come to pass in order to prepare, to prepare a plan to respond to it as though it did have to come to pass. In other words, the open theist can say the exact same thing and give the exact same assurance as any Arminian could. It's just that the open theist has a smarter view of God. <laughs> Think of it this way. Any God that would gain anything by virtue of having a blueprint of how things are going to plan out, play out, as opposed to anticipating possibilities, any God who would gain anything is a finite God, a God with limited intelligence. If, if, if the true God was playing you in chess, God is infinitely intelligent, he's playing you in chess, and he tells you in six moves you're going to be checkmated, and then Gabriel, the archangel, comes over and says, hey, God, we got a crystal ball over there, and I can tell you how they're going to move. God would say, why are you insulting me? Like, I need that in order to anticipate. That doesn't help me at all, because I'm looking at every possible move they could make as though it was the only move they could make. And so I have a response planned in, uh, in, in, in place for it. So only a finite God, a God of, of limited intelligence, would gain anything by virtue of foreknowing the future as a certainty as opposed to a possibility. When Bruce Ware tells me that the God of open theism, page 216, God's lesser glory, the God of open theism is a hand-wringing, nail-biting deity who can do nothing more than hope for the best. That tells me a whole lot about his view of God. But it doesn't say a thing about the open view of God. Apparently, his God, if, if the future wasn't exhaustively fixed, his God would be wringing his hands, biting his nails, and, and doing nothing more than guessing. But I submit to you that that just reflects a very limited view of God. If you have confidence in God's intelligence... Well, then you can be as confident with him facing possibilities as you would certainties. Okay, moving on. So the issue here, I want to reiterate, it has to do with the nature of creation. Uh, does, it, does, does creation include or exclude ontological or real possibilities? That's what's at issue here. The open view says yes, every other view says no. It's not about how much does God know and when does he know it. That's, that's in the entirely wrong issue. When I saw that in the title of a book, I got angry. The publisher was right there, and I reprimanded him. Okay, let's move on. Now, the, people have a lot of reasons for believing this. Uh, you know, we come at this from philosophical uh, angles, from scientific angles. There's a number of different reasons why uh, people give for holding that the future is to some degree open. I'm going to focus here very briefly and just give a small sampling of some of the biblical reasons why people come to this position, at least why I came to this position. Uh, because for me, as a follower of Jesus Christ, I feel really compelled to take the Bible as God's word. And so for me, the, 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 whatever other considerations you could offer, the strongest ones come from Scripture. And so here's a, a real brief uh, uh, expose on the uh, biblical case for the open view of God. And I'm just going to uh, organize it around six motifs or so. The first motif is this. You find in the Bible that God often, or sometimes, regrets. He even regrets things that turn out different than he thought they were going to turn out. Re he regrets decisions he himself made uh, because they don't turn out the way that he thought. For example, in Genesis 6, it says, The Lord was sorry that he made humankind on the earth. Oh my gosh, it's sorry, it's uh, And uh, it grieved him to his heart. And then he said, I regret that I have made them. So the question you've got to ask is this.
Can you genuinely regret something that turns out exact, exactly as you knew it would turn out? Or even worse, can you regret something that turns out exactly as you ordained it to turn out? I submit to you that that, maybe people are capable of that, but you wouldn't call them infinitely wise. <laughs> if you buy a car that has no engine, you know it has no engine. You buy the car precisely because it has no engine. You can't regret the fact that it doesn't have an engine once you got it home unless you're stupid. Uh, it, it's exactly the car that you bought. So also, if God eternally knew or ordained that the world would turn out exactly as it did when Genesis 6 happened, I submit to you, it doesn't, there's no coherent sense you can get, give that, that God re regretted it. And apparently the regret was serious because, according to the biblical narrative, he basically started over again. Salvage whatever could salvage and started over again. In 1 Samuel 15, he says, I regret that I made Saul king, for he's turned back from following me. And then in verse 35, it says, The Lord was sorry that he made king, uh, uh, Saul king over Israel. It seems like God was sincere when he put Saul, uh, made, made Saul king because he gave him all these promises. If you read 1 Samuel 13, If you walk with me, I'll bless you. You'll reign in this house, etc., etc., etc. But then Saul does not obey the Lord, and so the Lord says, I regret making him king. It seems to be that if the regret is genuine, it, it implies that there at least was the possibility that Saul would have been a good king. And, of course, the possibility that he wasn't, he turned out to be a bad king, and therefore the Lord regretted making him king. Uh, the Lord confronts improbabilities throughout the Bible. For example, uh, in Isaiah 5, it says, The Lord expected Israel to yield grapes, but it, yield, it yielded wild grapes. And so the Lord asked, What more was there to, uh, for, me, from, uh, for me to do for my vineyard than, that I, that I, than, than I have not done in it? When I expected it to yield uh, grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And because it unexpectedly failed to yield grapes, the Lord sadly concludes, I'll remove its hedge and it shall be devoured. So here's the question. Can God genuinely say, I expected this outcome, but instead got that outcome, if he eternally foreknew that it would, he would have the outcome that he in fact got? Or even worse, if he ordained, if he ordained Israel not to get it, how can he say, I expected you to get it? Uh, and not only that, but then work hard at trying to get them to get it if he was certain they wouldn't get it. So the, the open view just sort of takes this as a, 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 you know, a face value and says, if God genuinely expected Israel to yield grapes, and that just means bear godly fruit, then there was at least the possibility, if not the probability, that they would yield uh, good grapes. But in fact, they yield bad grapes. And so God was disappointed. Uh, an even stronger verse, I think, is Jeremiah, where the Lord says, I thought after she has done all this, she will return to me, but she did not return to me, referring to Israel. God's been wooing her and doing all these things. I thought how I, will, how I would set you among my children, and I thought you would call me my father and would not turn from following me. Instead, as a faithless wife, you have been faithless to me. Question, how could God say, I thought you would do this, but instead, you did that three times uh, if, in fact, God was eternally certain that they would do that. Or worse, God ordained that they would do that. Gee, I thought you would follow me even though I eternally foreknew you wouldn't. Gee, I really thought you'd follow me even though I ordained that you wouldn't. Uh, I submit to you that's not the easiest reading of the text. The easiest reading of the text suggests that it at least was possible, if not probable, that Israel, you would think that even God would think that after all that you did for Israel, they turned to you. But in fact, their stubbornness was more than what God uh, anticipated. But that doesn't mean, I don't think that he was caught totally out of surprise, because God's omniscient and whatever's possible, even remotely possible, God eternally knows and is prepared for it. So it's not like God is all of a sudden biting his nails, wondering, what am I going to do now? No, he knew this possibility from the foundation of the world, but it was improbable. And an omniscient God, when you confront improbability, says the improbable. Oh, that, that's improbable. I thought you were going to do something different. All right. The Lord gets frustrated all over the place in the Bible. Here's, here's one example. Strongest passage on prayer in the whole Bible, Ezekiel. You know, God's bringing judgment on Israel because he doesn't care for the poor and doesn't care for the immigrants. and uh, Those are the things that God usually judges nations for in, in the Bible. And so God's going to bring you know, judgment on Israel. And then God says to Ezekiel, I sought for anyone among them, the Israelites, who would repair the wall and stand in the breach before me on behalf of the land so that I would not destroy it. Clearly, doesn't, God doesn't want to bring judgment. Judgment is never God's first prerogative. He doesn't want to do this, but he looked for someone to stand in the gap like Moses did in Exodus 32. 
and change the course of Israel's history, but this time God couldn't find anybody. He says, so, uh, but I found no one, and therefore I have poured my indignation upon them. God looked for someone, tried to raise up a prayer warrior to stand in the gap like Moses did in Exodus 32, and you find that a number of places in the Bible, but this time he could not find anybody. So here's the question. Can you genuinely look for something you know is not there? You've known from all eternity it's not there. Can you look for something you ordain is not there? Right now, I am very certain there is not a $100 bill in my pocket. Okay, now I'm going to look for it. Ah, I'm looking for this $100 bill. Now, maybe I could do that, but you'd attribute it to Alzheimer's or something else. So, you know, if you wouldn't call me infinitely wise for looking for something I know is not there. And so also, if God looks for someone to stand in the gap, doesn't that imply the possibility that there was someone to stand in the gap? Which implies that the future is uh, partly open. Another strong motif in the Bible that denotes, I think, an open uh, view of the future is that God tests people to know what is in their heart. So he tested Abraham, and then after Abraham uh, was willing to offer up his son, the Lord says, Now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your, your son. God gives the time of his knowledge and the cause of his knowledge. Now I know, since you have not withheld your son. Now, if God eternally knew this or had ordained this, first of all, you have to ask what would be the point of the test in the first place. And secondly, you'd have to ask, what does he mean by this statement? Uh, this taken at face value, it seems to suggest that the reason God tested Abraham was to find out whether or not he would be a faithful covenant partner. In Deuteronomy 8, it says, The Lord kept the Israelites in the desert, in the desert 40 years, in order to humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. He wanted to know. God wanted to know. Elsewhere in Deuteronomy 13, it says, He told the Israelites that the Lord allowed false prophets to be correct sometimes because, quote, He is testing you to know whether you indeed love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul. Now, one of the traditional ways of handling these passages, and probably a lot of you have heard it, is that it said, well, God tests us not for him to know anything, but for us to know things. Because, of course, God already knows our character and what we're going to do. So God tests us not for his sake, but for our sake. Which would be a wonderful interpretation of these passages if it weren't for the fact that the passage says the exact opposite, which ought to be a problem to our exegesis. Uh, the passages say specifically that God tested people so he would know. He wants to know what is in their heart, which means what will they do? What are you going to choose to do? Will you follow me or not? One of the uh, strongest, I think strongest motifs in the Bible that really uh, expresses the open view of the future is the fact that the Lord speaks and sometimes thinks in future subjunctive terms, in terms of if, in terms of possibilities. Since, you know, we're all just humans, we don't really know anything, uh, and, and we're trying to figure this out, maybe it really behooves us to pay close attention to how God speaks and thinks about the future in the Bible. And so here's a few little examples. Uh, the, one of my favorites is in Exodus chapter 3, verse 8 uh, through 4, 9. And basically, it, the, here's what happens. Uh, God says, uh, Moses, go down to Egypt and tell the elders to lead the people out of, uh, out of uh, uh, Egypt and tell them that I am has sent you. They will listen, the Lord says. Moses, apparently being a good open theist, says, uh, well, what if they don't? I love it. If open theism is heresy, we're in good company because Moses and Jeremiah and others are right, are, are right up there. What if they don't? Now, God doesn't say, dude, did you know I've got this crystal ball and I look right into it and I can see what the outcome is? He doesn't say that. He says, okay, Moses, uh, here's what you do. Uh, throw your stick on the ground. It will turn into a snake. Pick it up again. He says, if they don't believe you, they, they, perhaps they'll believe that miracle. But if they don't believe that miracle, here's what you do. Put your hand in your coat, pull it out, it'll be leprous. Put it back in, pull it out, it'll be, uh, it'll be whole. If they don't believe the first miracle, perhaps they'll believe the second miracle. But if they don't believe either of those two miracles, here's what you do. Take some water out of the Nile, pour it on the ground, it'll turn into blood. If they don't believe the first two miracles, surely they'll believe the third miracle. Now here's God talking in terms of if, maybe, then. Uh, yes, that the children of Israel are going to get out of Egypt is certain. That God prophesied that back in Genesis 15, 16 to, 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 to uh, uh, Abraham. That much is settled. How many miracles is this going to take? You know, God's basically saying, dude, I can pull this off. I've got a lot of tricks up my sleeve. Trust me. But see, there's, there's de a determinate reality and there's also flexibility built into it. Another one is uh, Exodus 13, 17, which says the Lord decided, 
to, lead, uh, to lead the Israelites, uh, uh, not, not to lead the Israelites along the shortest route to Canaan, because they might have to face the Philistine, Philistines. And the Lord, thought, the Lord thought, if they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. That's just, that's, this is a little peekaboo into God's thought process. There's the possibility they're going to face war. And if they face war, if, they might, not certain, but they might decide to go back to Egypt. Uh, there you go. It seems to me that that implies that they might not face war and they might not go back to Egypt, but God is sort of saying, here's the most probable thing, and therefore I'm going to take them on a longer route to Canaan. In Ezekiel 12, I, you know, God often has these prophets do bizarre things, uh, enacting prophecies and, and stuff like that. Uh, just bizarre stuff. In fact, one, uh, one that I don't have here, but I could, but it's, uh, I just found it recently in Jeremiah 4. Uh, where the Lord says to Jeremiah to enact a prophecy, he says, I want you to cook food on human excrement. And I, I know, it's right there in the Bible. Hallelujah, the, the word of God. And Jeremiah says, Lord, that's disgusting. I can't do that. The Lord changed his mind. I never noticed this before. He goes, okay, just use human, human or, 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 or uh, cook it on animal excrement. I, I know they'll open this passage. Not the most <laughs> edifying one, perhaps, but it's openness nonetheless. Well, here God tells Ezekiel, okay, Ezekiel, pick up your bags, walk throughout all of Israel, and, and, and hopefully the people will see that, that if they don't shape up, they're going to be deported. That's, that, that was the message. And then he motivates them to do this bizarre prophecy, walking with his bags in his hands. He says, perhaps the people will understand and will listen, even though they're a, a rebellious house. Now, what's amazing is that the people don't understand, and they get deported, which raises a really interesting question. If it was certain to God that they wouldn't understand because he foreknows everything from eternity, then what did he mean when he, when he told Ezekiel perhaps they would understand? Wasn't he, in fact, lying? If I tell John here to go out into my car and look in the front of the seat and perhaps you'll find a $100 bill, even though I purposely I made sure I'm certain there is no $100 bill, uh, aren't I lying to him? At best, I'm jerking him around. Hey, go out there. Perhaps you'll uh, find a $100 bill. Yeah, that's right. You see, I, it seems to me if God motivates people with, with these, that's, a, that's a, a sort of a promise. Perhaps he, they might get it, even though I know they won't, or even worse, even though I predestined them not to get it, perhaps they might. <laughs> what does language mean? And then finally, we have uh, a Jesus in the garden. He threw himself on the ground and, and prayed, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Now, this is an amazing prayer. Because no, no, no one knows the mind of the Father like Jesus. What's more is that if there's anything in the New Testament that is fixed ahead of time, it's the death of Jesus. I've come into this world to die, uh, to, to, to be crucified. Uh, it, it Acts says that Herod and Pilate did unto Jesus what God had foreordained them to do, uh, or that, that would be done. He didn't ordain them to do it, but that he was going to get crucified was foreordained. So if anything is fixed in the Bible, it's this. Jesus is going to die. And yet here Jesus is at the 11th hour trying to change the plan. Father, if it's possible, can we do this another way? Now in this case, it wasn't possible. But the exception proves the rule. Sometimes it must be possible to change the plan, even the 11th hour, even of major things. Uh, and so if we take Jesus' prayer as a paradigm, we ought to be uh, seeing that plans for God aren't always fixed in stone uh, ahead of time. You find many times in the Bible that uh, God will say, I'm not going to change my mind. But the exception proves the rule, which leads to my next point. The Lord does change his mind. 39 times so far as I know explicitly and over 200 times, it's implied in the text where, the, where an intention, a course, gets altered in a different direction. Here's a classic one, Jeremiah 18, where it says at one moment the Lord, this is where, where, where the story here is, is that the Lord says to uh, Jeremiah, you know, these people are really stubborn. I made, he made a prophecy that they're going to be uh, judged. And all the people, if you read verse 12 in uh, 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 Jeremiah 12, they're all, uh, 18, they're all saying, it's no use. It's no use. They were fatalists. They were, they were Calvinists. Uh, God, de <laughs> God decreed that we're going to be destroyed. We're going to be destroyed. So God says, no. He takes Jeremiah to this potter's house and shows him this potter who's making this, this, this uh, vessel, this cup or whatever, and the thing isn't turning out right. So he changes his plan and makes a different kind of, of, of a vessel, uh, a different kind of, of, of pottery. And then the Lord says to Jeremiah, look, I'm the potter, you're the clay. 
If that potter can improvise and change his mind, so can I. And so it says, at one moment I may declare concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will pluck up and, and, and break down and destroy it. But if that nation concerning which I have spoken turns from its evil, I will change my mind, Nacham, about the disaster that I intended, I did intend to bring on it. I really intended it, but I really will change my mind. And at another moment I may declare concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will build and, and plant it. But if it does evil in my sight, not listening to my voice, then I will change my mind about the good that I intended to do to it. Uh, and uh, he says, look, I am the potter shaping evil against you and devising a plan against you. Turn now all of you from your evil way and amend your ways and your doings. What God is saying is this. Look, just because I said that I'm going to judge you doesn't mean I'm going to judge you. Don't go fatalistic on me here. I, I'm flexible, just like the potter. He can change his plans depending on what the clay does. I'll change my plans depending on what the clay does. This is all the more important because this is what Paul is referring to in Romans 9. Uh, the whole point of Romans 9 is the opposite of what it's the reading that Augustine and others have given it. It's about the, the, the wise flexibility of God's sovereignty. He's flexible. He works with the clay. He's not, he'll, he'll change his plans if the clay will, will change. People often say that, uh, one of the responses is that, well, it looks to us that God changes his mind. That's just in terms of appearance, but God doesn't really change his mind. And uh, that's just a figure of speech. Among other responses, we just need to notice that if God didn't really change his mind, then God really didn't intend to do what he said he intended to do. And you're getting very close to charging God with duplicity. Uh, I didn't really intend to do that, even though I, I told you that I did. One of the things, if, unless you have good reasons to think otherwise, it's good to take the scripture at its most obvious uh, uh, meaning. Other indications of a partly open future, I'll just give one here. You find a number of miscellaneous texts that are interesting when read from an a open perspective. For example, the Lord, Peter says, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. So you have this idea that God is patiently waiting for more and more to come in. It seems like it's very fixed there. But even more surprising is what he says two verses later. You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. So apparently, uh, we can move this thing up or push it back depending on how we live and to how we evangelize and, and things of that sort. Um, it, it, it suggests that the day or the hour is not absolutely fixed. When Jesus says that only the Father knows that, it's easy to take it when in Mark 13 says no man knows the day or the hour but only the Father in heaven. That can just be taken as an, idiom, a, 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 an idiomatic way of saying that it's in the Father's authority. It's like if I say to my daughter when she's 16, look, at, I, you know, I, know the day, I, I know the day and the hour when I'm going to give you those keys to drive in a car. Uh, but it doesn't mean I have it written on the calendar now. It means I know what I'm looking for. And when that day and hour comes, I'll let you drive. Until then, you're going to have to suffer. All right. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll close with just a couple of practical considerations. Practical advantages here. I will submit to you that the open view of God exalts God's wisdom and sovereignty more than any alternative view. Uh, aside from the, the biblical support for it, um, I, I think it has that advantage. It, it, it presents a view of God's sovereignty that is genuinely praiseworthy. Think about it this way. Picture three chess champions. Uh, chess champion number one is assured of winning because chess champion number one is playing a program that chess champion number one programmed himself. Okay, so uh, I'm assured of winning because I control all the pieces of my opponent. Okay, so you're assured of winning. Chess champion number two didn't control, didn't program the, uh, the computer that is playing, uh, that, that she's playing, but a chess champion number two has a printout of exactly how the computer will respond to every possible move, and therefore is assured of winning. You have a blueprint of how this computer will act. You've got a manual. Chess champion number two, one controls the opponent. Chess champion number two simply foreknows the opponent. Chess champion number three isn't playing a computer at all, but a, 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 an intelligent agent, a human being. Maybe even a world-class human being, uh, chess champion human being. But uh, chess champion number three is uh, assured of winning, not because she's controlling the moves of her opponent or because she foreknows the moves of her opponent, but just because she's so smart. 
She can anticipate every move that this opponent will make and has a plan in place in case that opponent moves in that way. The question would be, which of those chess champions is most praiseworthy? And I submit to you that only the third is, because only the third has to use intelligence at all. It doesn't take any intelligence or wisdom to control someone, nor does it take any intelligence or wisdom simply to have some kind of esoteric knowledge, a crystal ball. That, 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 you, know, you can see the future the same way I can see the computer right here. That doesn't take any intelligence. That's just a kind of a weird ability that you have. But the Bible exalts God's wisdom in running the world as much, at least as much, as exalting God's power. And wisdom is problem-solving ability, how to outsmart other agents. And so I submit to you that the open view is the only one where God has to rely on God's intelligence uh, to uh, respond to uh, intelligent agents. Secondly, uh, let's see here. Okay, uh, the, the open view emphasizes God's genuine relationality. In the open view, God is a God who is genuinely impacted by us. There's a give and take in real time between us and God. What happens to us affects God. We have the power to impact God. I submit to you that a relationship is real to the extent that both parties have an influence on one another. A relationship in which only one party has influence is a monopoly, not a relationship. There has to be reciprocity for the relationship to be authentic. And in this view of God, there really is reciprocity. God impacts us, not coercively, but still impacts us. We impact God. And there's a moment-by-moment -moment relationship that we sustain with God. Because the world's always changing, uh, and circumstances are opening and closing, and windows of opportunity are opening and closing, the open view really encourages people to walk with God on a daily basis. Yesterday's commands may no longer apply because that situation may have changed. So you need to listen to God like a good soldier, uh, not being too overly involved in civilian affairs like Paul says in, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, but rather always seeking to please your commanding officer. You keep your walkie-talkie on. You listen to the Spirit because God's moving you depending on the circumstances uh, that are going on. So it really emphasizes God's relationality. Third, the open view squares with our experience. Here's the thing. Whatever you believe, you're going to live like an open theist. <laughs> Because there's no other way to live. It's true. I, I, everyone lives and thinks like an open theist. There's no other way to live. You will respond to things tonight and tomorrow and the rest of your life in this way. You'll assume that most of the world is not up for you to decide, but a small part is. You'll presuppose a lot of determinate things about the future, but you'll also presuppose that some things are up to you to decide. You're going to live like that. If I'm making a decision about which, what airline to take, uh, to go on a certain trip, I have to presuppose the airline will be there, which these days is quite a risk, I suppose. Uh, that the law of gravity will still work, and the, the money will still have some value, which again is another stretch the way the economy is going, but you get the general point. I presuppose most of reality, which frees me to make a decision about some of reality. And I have options. And I choose between those options. And the very act of deliberating between options presupposes that I believe it's up to me to decide. There's no way to deliberate between option A and option B without presupposing that it's up to me to decide option A or option B. There's no way to deliberate between two options in such a way that you manifest a belief that it's not up to you to decide between A and B. So Charles Purr said that, that a belief that you can't possibly act on is a meaningless belief. And if he's right, and I'm right right now what I'm saying about deliberation, then the only coherent belief is open, the, the open view of the future. Because uh, it's the only view you can actually act on when acting counts. Did you have to follow that? You can ask questions if you have questions about it, but I think it works. We all act as though the future is part of them. We pray, but we also lock our doors at night. All right. Uh, this view, as we've been discussing here, squares with uh, contemporary science. Some of us would argue better than, than um, uh, deterministic views. Uh, increasingly, the paradigm of science, as we've been talking about in the conference last summer, as presupposing or at least uh, holding up the possibility of spontaneity and creativity and openness. Uh, Newtonian mechanism is no longer the predominant paradigm in many fields of science. Uh, and, and this is the view of the world that uh, some of us believe that we are moving into on the scientific end of things. It helps, I think, with, with the problem of evil in some respects. Uh, at least to this extent. 
I used to really puzzle over why God would create human beings that he knew were going to go to hell. Um, I can understand why God would give freedom with the risk that people might use it to damn themselves and maybe harm other people and so on. But why would you give freedom if you know that they're going to use it in a way that would land them in eternal hell? Even worse, why would you give freedom if you predestined them to go to hell? Which I guess means you didn't really give them freedom. But uh, uh, it's one thing to say that. It's, it's like you, you can understand a, a, a parent perhaps, perhaps giving an 18-year-old who wants to go hunting a gun. But when you read a story that we read a couple years ago about some parents who gave their psychotic son who had suicidal tendencies and, and, and obsessed on guns and killing himself, why they gave him a gun, because they're almost certain he would use it to kill himself, well, that seems kind of criminal. Uh, so also, if God gives stuff to us that he knows we're going to use in, in these, ter these terrible ways, isn't he somewhat liable for it? Even more puzzling, however, is this. Why would God plead with people all their life to get to them to accept him and obey him and, and be saved if he knows or ordains that they aren't going to be saved? It, it strikes me as uh, why you're trying to do something you're eternally certain will never be done or you even ordained would never be done. So in certain respects, I think it helps with the problem of evil. It motivates kingdom work. This has been one of the things that I have uh, personally found most uh, people respond to is that when they accepted the view of an open future, they saw that things genuinely hang on them. Whether or not you pray can really make a difference. Uh, whether or not you, you live a certain life, things genuinely hang on this. It takes away that sense that so many people have that life is sort of a pro forma activity. If the future is exhaustively settled, whether it's settled in God's mind or in God's will, there's, it, it's very easy to get a sense that you're just going through the motions. Que sera, sera. But in the open view, things genuinely hang on whether or not you pray, live a certain way, and other things. And the one thing that's kind of awesome, I mean, it, it's, it, it's, it's like, whoa, we've really got some responsibility here. On the other hand, it really infuses life with significance. You really are a partner with God. God genuinely needs you to step up to the plate and play the role that he's calling you to because things really do hang in the balance. And the final thing is that I think the open view solves some otherwise paradoxical situations. Um, it has some, uh, I think, some uh, pastoral implications. For example, the one I give in, in the book God of the Possible is this. A young lady that I knew, I met her, uh, she had been to, at Bethel, and then eight years later, she dropped out of the church, and eight years later I met her because I preached at a church, and she came forward with this problem, and here's the problem. From the age of 13 on, she had a burden for Tanzania uh, and wanted to be a missionary to Tanzania and just prayed that God would open the doors for her to be a missionary to Tanzania and, of course, that she would marry a man who had a burden for Tanzania. And uh, so she prayed that from 13 on. And she had one of these, of course, very standard Christian sleepless in Seattle ideas about romance that God has the one right person picked out and, and God, you know, keep him pure. Uh, you know, so be pure for me and, and uh, all those kind of things. Uh, and, you know, I'm sure God blesses that and they mean well, but it, it really leads some screwy conclusions. Anyways, <laughs> she ends up going to Bethel, and this guy ends up going to Bethel, and during Founders Week, their opening week, spring, you know, when they're first coming in, they meet each other, and they share their stories, and boom, they fall in love. And for four years, these folks... Uh, you know, court one another and talk and they do everything right. They stayed godly. They read the Bible a lot. They, 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 they spoke with their elders about the relationship. And they, I mean, if, they, they really did it right. At least this is not what she tells me and I believe her. Uh, at the, as seniors in, in college, uh, they're getting ready to get married and become missionaries to Tanzania. Uh, he proposes, but she doesn't have the green light yet. She's like, I just haven't got that absolute thumbs up. Uh, they talk to the parents, talk to the pastors, talk to everybody. Everyone says, this, you can, if, if ever there's a marriage made in heaven, this is it. Finally, she says she gets the yes, the wow. This is absolutely, God says, go for it. So they get married right, at, right after college. They go to a school where they get trained missionaries. About eight months into it, he ends up having an affair with another student uh, at, at the place. It's catastrophic, cataclysmic, terrible, painful, but he repents. They come back together, and now they're going to get the program back uh, you know, going again. A little while after that, he cheats with her again. 
and then again. And uh, as this is going on, they finally you know, take a break from missionary school. As this is going on, his heart is becoming harder and harder. Uh, he's beginning to be verbally abusive. At once was physically abusive, almost broke her jaw. Um, and finally decides, announces to her that uh, he is leaving her to move in with this uh, other lady that he's been loving for the last two years, just after she found out that she was pregnant. Uh, okay, the world comes to a cataclysmic end. This lady was, of course, distraught about the end of her marriage, the end of her dream of being a missionary to Tanzania, and on and on and on. But her main issue was this. If this is how God answers prayer, no thank you. God set me up. Nice joke, God. And the, and, and the anger was just, it was just so, so, so tangible. Uh, a 13-year-old girl praying all of her life for two things. Uh, and I'm not smoking pot like other kids. I'm just trying to find your will. I'm praying about Tanzania, and a man who goes to Tanzania, you give me the exact, but it looks like the right person. All the hopes and dreams are right there, and bam, he ends up being a cheat, an abusive cheat. And, um, and you knew that going into this. You gave the green light, knowing that this would happen. Thank you very much. I was able, and of course friends said, well, you know, maybe you weren't really seeking God's will. Maybe it was a sin mistake. Maybe you weren't hearing right. Maybe there was sin in your life. Or maybe he did ordain the whole thing, and it's for your better. There's lessons you're to learn, blah, 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 blah. And that just makes her matter and matter and matter, as you can understand. I was able to offer an alternative. I brought her to 1 Samuel 15. What if God said yes? Because this was a, a wise thing to do. There was a high probability that this marriage would work out right. You guys would become superstars in Tanzania. For the kingdom of God, it would have been beautiful. But there's free will. And where there's free will, the best of plans can go awry. And what if God now regrets this marriage even more than you do? What you need to know is that this isn't the end of the world. It's the end of that plan. It's the end of that marriage. But God's always got a plan B and a plan C and a plan D. And he's able to bring good out of evil with amazing ingenuity if you'll just surrender to him and work with him. But you don't have to blame God for this. And that was a paradigm shift that allowed her to get back in the game. And it's, uh, uh, there's some pastoral situations like that that I think that uh, an open perspective has an opportunity to offer people ways of framing the issue that keep them from being angry and bitter at God and, and things of that sort.